maneuvers. Here are a lot of the building blocks we just talked about and how we can use those uh, in more of a uh, larger scale usage, and that's maneuvers. Now, we offer a pilot maneuvers guide here at Sporties. We also offer our instrument rating course, which includes 27 individual maneuvers. If you need some direction or some help on these maneuvers, I will mention the instrument rating course is discounted for the month of February for IFR month. We'll get into some more detail on that in a little bit. First maneuver I like to recommend is the 00 takeoff slash departure. This was a challenging one for me. It was fun, it was enjoyable, but I also understood why we were doing it. It's to simulate you're taking out of an airport that you wouldn't necessarily land at, and you're going somewhere else with much better weather. You just need to get rolling. The 00 takeoff is enjoyable when you can only see about 20 to 30 feet in front of you. And you really got to make sure you uh, you stay on those rudder pedals to keep the runway center line in front of you. It is a fun maneuver and one we can practice easily and safely in a flight simulator. And then also a departure. If we want to uh, look at what is more required in the airlines industry or the professional pilot settings, departures are going to be a more prominent flight plan module uh, when you get up to those higher or more prestigious flying aircraft. Uh, course intercept slash track. This is a very helpful thing to understand in a simulator. Understanding a VOR and radials, and it did not matter which direction my aircraft was positioned. It was more about where I was latitude and longitude. Uh, that was a, a big point for me in my training and something you can easily understand in a flight simulator rather than having to go uh, fly a few flights and understand it when you're paying a lot of money per hour. I also like the challenge of intercepting a VOR radial when you're say two or three miles out rather than 10 miles out. The sensitivity gets a lot uh, less and more challenging and it, it is a good factor or a challenge for you to intercept these angles when closer, when at higher speeds, uh, a good thing to critique and it helps you out as a navigator. And then we also have arrivals. Uh, just as departures were an upgrade from taking off, arrivals are uh, the in-between from in route to approach when we get into some of those larger aircraft and something we can factor in um, to our flight simulator and its usage. And here is the text description of that same arrival. Holding entries. A holding pattern is something I never want to fly as a pilot, uh, but I know for a fact that there are a lot of pilots out there flying them. For instance, I was on a flight, a commercial flight. I was a passenger in the back heading down to Sarasota a few months ago. There was a quick moving thunderstorm passing through our area. So the pilots entered a hold, held for about 20 minutes, and then we continued on to Sarasota Airport. So in essence, the professionals do it. It makes sense for us to have a understanding of how it's used, and I bet you're going to have an instructor or a designated pilot examiner who's going to throw one or two of these at you. So it's helpful to know how to enter the parallel, the direct, or the teardrop entry for a hold. One thing that can move a lot of these pieces together uh, that really trans transitions into helping with approaches are the instrument flight patterns. There's pattern A on the right side, which is based off of heading changes and airspeed changes. Uh, second intervals at 15 seconds at a standard rate turn, I've now turned to this heading. Uh, at 60 seconds in a standard rate turn, I've reversed my course, things of that sort. And once you've got pattern A under your belt, you can go ahead and factor in pattern B, which also incorporates altitude changes, descending at 500 feet per minute, doing an emergency pull-up. If you can fly these patterns proficiently and consistently in a simulator, it's going to help you out a lot as you start flying approaches in real aircraft. The DME arc, I've always been a fan of. Uh, I think it is challenging slash intriguing to keep your radius or distance from uh, the navigating source constant. Uh, I've always enjoyed it, and I understand it can be a very helpful phase of flying an approach. So I always like recommending one or two of those whenever you get a chance. I also like flying, you know, the GPS approach. This is the more prominent, the more common approaches we're seeing as aviation and navigation progresses. Uh, 
working with your autopilot, working with your avionics can make it uh, a very quick, a very easy approach. Not to say we should be relying on them, but I'm saying it can reduce our workload. Uh, it has a very low uh, accuracy issue. So overall GPS approaches I think will become more and more common as we progress in aviation in years. So it is worth our time to get better acquainted with them. The ILS approach and the ILS back course approach. I love these approaches uh, mainly because when I started to learn the ILS approach, it was a lot like a game for me. Keeping CDI1 needles, the localizer vertical and the glide slope horizontal and hitting that target the circle like a bullseye, it was always like a game to me and I enjoyed it. It made sense. So I always like to fly ILS approaches. Uh, another challenging thing about an ILS approach is you're flying in a cone that gets tighter and tighter. So as we can see, the localizer sensitivity uh, gets more and more as we progress. For instance, when we're five nautical miles out, one dot deflection on the localizer is we're off course at 300 feet. When you look up uh, a, a row, when we're one dot off at 3,500 feet from the threshold, we're now 100 feet off. So the same indication on our CDI, but yet 300 to 100, it gets you know a little tighter. Same for glide slope. When we're five nautical miles out, it's 50 feet. And then when we get 3,500 feet away, it's only eight feet for a one dot deflection. So that's another added challenge of flying a ILS approach, uh, but a, a, a great way to get back better acclimated with um, an approach that's been around for a while and usually brings you down to some pretty close minimums to the ground. The ILS back course is worth mentioning. Uh, long story short, it's going to be um, backwards day when you're flying the ILS back course. You will go ahead and tune the uh, back course and you have to tell your brain, okay, what I'm used to, I'm going to flip. For instance, here we have CDI1. The indication is the course is to my left. I should turn to the left to intercept it and then go back to course heading. Well, our GPS is correct here, indicating the course is actually to our right. In this back course scenario, we have to flip our beliefs and we are now the localizer needle, that's the airplane, and the course is the dotted vertical lines, which is different from when you're flying the ILS approach. It's challenging. Uh, you think, why do we do it? It is a unique feature of having the ILS system out there. It is something, a uh, check ride might throw at you. So again, it's worth trying once or twice and better understanding in a simulator. The VRR approach, uh, this plays on the VOR tracking I mentioned earlier. I like these because they've been around for such a long time. I look at it as these were the approaches, the generation before us, and then the generation before that were flying uh, as they flew in bad weather. Uh, it is a dying approach. We're not gonna see many of these more around as things get updated but it is still enjoyable. It requires a well understanding of navigation equipment and one to fly from time to time. An approach down to minimums, I think is worth highlighting. Uh, here we have the ILS or localizer runway 28 left into John Glenn, Columbus International. And as you can see here, the ILS mins are 1,015 feet. So I'm gonna jump in Microsoft Flight Simulator I'm going to take that cloud layer down to 1,015 feet, and then I'm going to go fly that approach. I'm going to make the clouds down to the legal minimums, fly the approach, and get a better understanding for what is legal to do in an aircraft. And as you can see, as we are about to pass through 1,100, I can just start to make out the runway. So this is a good way to bring that theorized missed approach point or what's the very limit of what that weather can be for me to fly this approach, you can go practice it in a simulator and see what those uh, bumpers are for us in safety when it comes to flying instrument approaches. Approach down to minimums, sometimes you're gonna have to do a missed approach. Uh, this is another great one to practice. Um, you know, as pilots, we hope there's never a missed approach, but sometimes it's out of our controls. Whether we can't see the ground, whether there's a type of animal that runs across the runway, maybe a vehicle 
The MIST approach is good to practice. In the instrument realm, it even gets more challenging. For instance, on this maneuver, we are supposed to climb straight out to 1,800, climbing left turn to 3,500, then direct to the HVQ VOR slash TME. And all the while, there's a lot happening. We are tuning new frequencies. We may have been in contact with the tower. We may have to talk to somebody else or uh, whoever is in charge of the airspace. We're now tuning, identifying, flying to a new VOR, finding a radial, preparing to enter a hold. There's a lot going on. So it makes sense for us to practice this at home, a few iterations every once in a while, and feel better prepared for if we ever have to go full power at our decision point. Challenging approaches. I could create a whole webinar on challenging approaches. There are thousands out there. But some that I wanted to pull quickly for today's webinar, and I, uh, I hope everyone goes out and finds some that are going to be fun for them and also challenging at the same time. A few that I wanted to include are starting with the Aspen localizer slash DME. The airport elevation is at 7,838 feet. So a flare in a Cessna 172 is going to be quite different there than it is in an airport closer to mean sea level. Uh, next up, we've got an a approach that you can't really fly in a Cessna 172, uh, but in a simulator, in essence, you could. Or if you get into, say, a multi-engine aircraft or something pressurized, maybe you could. Uh, this has a lot of different waypoints, and uh, it's kind of interesting that you fly towards some mountains to circle around into a valley. We don't have to stay domestic. We can go international. We could do the double DME arc in Bolivia which uh, is one of the few I've seen that's a double DME arc, two different radiuses there. We can also fly into the Kathmandu in Nepal approach with multiple step-down fixes based off your distance from that VOR. Uh, a lot of challenge there. We can get out of the uh, challenging weather or mountainous regions and do a visual approach. For instance, here we have the Boston visual approach that uses features on the ground as times to turn. So as we're coming in and we see a lighthouse, we'll then turn left to heading 275. Once we fly or can make visual contact with an old fort, we then turn to the right for the inbound heading runway. It is unique, but they're out there. I went ahead and I flew this approach with four flight backing me up. And as you can see, once I saw the old fort, I turned right to 330 and took it into Boston. Here's from the left seat, and then here is from outside the aircraft uh, as we traversed that old fort, which was the final approach fix, if you will. 